In the last video I uploaded, a subscriber requested that I make a video talking about anti-convulsants and that is exactly what I'll be doing in today's video. Hello, my name is Imolia Yabusari. I am an engineer registered nurse and midwife and I'm also a registered nurse in the United Kingdom. On this channel, I talk about nursing, healthcare. Sometimes I film some lifestyle videos just showing you about my life as a nurse. Like I do in all my videos, I ensure that my videos are very, very simplified that any nursing student, regardless of what level they are in, entry level, final year, they can always understand whatever I am trying to explain in my videos. Just like I said, I'll be talking about anticonvulsants and just to get right into it, what exactly are anticonvulsants? Now, anticonvulsants are a group of medications that are used to control seizures or to prevent seizures. These seizures are sometimes also called convulsions. So, anti-convulsants. Anti meaning to work against. Convulsion, which are seizures, um, irregular activities or irregular body movements caused by irregular electrical activities within the brain. So a group of medications that works against the convulsions are called anticonvulsants. Very easy to understand. So what are the indications for anticonvulsants? In other words, where are, in what situations or for what reasons would a patient or an individual be um, prescribed anticonvulsants? Or in what situation does anticonvulsants become an important medication? The first one is epilepsy which is a condition where people have repeated seizures. You also have status epilepticus, which is a medical emergency where seizures are continuous. They are static and they do not stop. They could also be used in situations like febrile seizures, which are seizures that are caused by high fever. And this is very, very common in children. It could also be used in cases of neuropathic pain when the person has a lot of nerve pain and you're trying to prevent the person from going into seizures. It could also be used in situations like bipolar disorder where somebody has um, episodes of high moods and low moods and they come alternatively. So it's called bi like bipolar, like two opposite types of moods by two polar like at the end of two poles, one person having two different types of moods going up and down, that is a bipolar disorder. So anticonvulsant medications are one of the classes of medications that are used in the treatment of bipolar disorders. Next, you also can use um, anticonvulsants to prevent migraine because some anticonvulsants may help to reduce headache. Now, there are different drugs or different medications that fall under this big heading called anticonvulsants. So we are going to be talking about the different classes of anticonvulsants and examples of drugs that fall under each of these classes. The first class I'm going to be talking about are the sodium channel blockers. Just from what the name implies, you have like a gate or a pathway through which sodium is supposed to get access to the brain cell. So this medication stops sodium from passing through that its channel and gaining access to the brain cells. So they are called sodium channel blockers. That is just basically how to understand what they do. Now from biochemistry or physiology, you understand that sodium is one of the nutrients that a lot of the, the body organs needs to actually function. Okay, so the brain specifically also needs sodium to function. So if there is overactivity in the brain, what you should do ideally is just like something is doing too much work because it is getting too much food so what you're going to try to do to stop it from overworking is to reduce the amount of food you're giving it i hope you're getting like my analogy so you're trying to stop the amount of sodium that the brain gets that is how sodium channel blockers comes into play i am trying my best to make this as simplified as possible if you want more extensive information you can always refer back to your textbooks. Remember, these are just simplified videos. So what are the examples of medications that fall under the sodium channel blockers? A very common example is phenytoin. Also, you have carbamazepine, which um, some people also call Tegretol. Like that is, you, you, can, you might hear it's being referred to as Tegretol more than carbamazepine. They also have drugs like Lamotrigine. 
The next class of medications that could be used as anticonvulsants are calcium channel blockers. If you are very consistent with my previous pharmacology videos, you will know that I mentioned calcium channel blockers when I was talking about antihypertensives. Now, they also come into play as anticonvulsants. And just like sodium channel blockers, this one specifically block calcium from gaining access to the brain cells to reduce the hyperactivity or to prevent the hyperactivity from happening. You get the gist. So a very common example are gabapentin. You also have medications like paragabalin, which all work together to prevent convulsion. Now, if you are familiar with gabapentin and pregabalin and you've been administering this to patients, you would wonder that I think these are actually painkillers. Now, let me explain. If you remember when I was talking about the indications for anticonvulsants, I mentioned that nerve pain is a risk factor for somebody going into convulsions. So these two medications, gabapentin and pregabalin, which are actually calcium channel blockers, work by reducing nerve pain. So by that, by extension, they also reduce the chances of somebody coming back down with convulsions. I hope you get what I'm saying. So that is why you would have this medication because you have some medications that can fall under three, four, five different classes at the same time. So you don't get confused. They work as um, nerve painkillers, basically. But they also prevent anti uh, convulsions by extension. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So you don't get confused as to which class these two medications belong to. They, they have like the same function, but by extension, they are preventing something else. I hope I'm not rambling. Another class of medication that I'm going to be talking about are the GABA enhancers. The word GABA actually refers to gamma aminobutyric acid, which is actually a neurotransmitter or a chemical messenger in the brain. And what they do is that they slow down the brain by blocking specific signals in the CNS. So these are neurotransmitters that on a normal day, they slow down the brain, like they calm the brain. So if convulsions are actually like hyperactivity in the brain or irregular electrical activity in the brain, a neurotransmitter like GABA that is known to slow down the brain would be very useful in calming down convulsions. So there are medications now that if you use them, they sort of more or less enhance the work of GABA, which on a normal day, it slows down the brain. So it's just like you have something that is hot already. It is burning and you know that you have um, a tap that can actually release water on what is burning. So what you just need to do is to increase the flow of water to whatever is burning to cool it down as quick as possible or connect like a bigger pipe to that tap and, you know, connect like three, four, five different pipes to that type tap. So you have enough flow of water going to whatever is burning. So that is basically how I think or how I understand GABA enhance uh, enhancer as um, anticonvulsants so examples of medications that fall under GABA enhancers are diazepam lorazepam phenobarbital and vaporic acid you see diazepam <laughs> if you don't know any drug in mental health if you don't know any medication in mental health you should at least know diazepam and that is also what is called valium I hope you get my point. So these GABA enhancers, a lot of times they are the, one of the most common medications that you see being used to treat um, people with um, convulsions. So diazepam, lorazepam. I'm very sure you're now beginning to understand why you would commonly see those medications on the world. Just before I move on, if you're looking for a very free place to get access to nursing resources, I'm talking free audio tutorials. Um, free practice tests like quizzes to prepare you for your exam. You can also get study plans for your nursing exam and midwifery exams. There are also free um, practice tests for midwifery students. You can do everything on my website at www.nursingwithlight.com. I'll leave the links to that in the description box below. Check that out and I wish you success in your exams. Let's go on. Another class of medications that fall under anticonvulsants are glutamate inhibitors. Now, this glutamate is more or less the opposite of GABA. I said GABA is um, a neurotransmitter that more or less slows down the brain. But glutamate, on the other hand, increases the activity of the brain. So, if you have the brain already becoming overactive, 
electrical impulses in the brain already becoming too much and there is already something in that brain that on a normal day its job is to make the brain or to enhance the activity of the brain what you need to do is to reduce the supply of that neurotransmitter to the brain so that is why glutamate inhibitors the word inhibition means to stop so glutamate inhibitors are medications that stop the activity of glutamate in the brain and examples of medications that are known to be glutamate inhibitors are topiramate and perampanel now we have talked about four different classes the sodium channel blockers the calcium channel blockers the GABA enhancers and glutamate inhibitors the sodium channel blockers stops the um, reduces the amount of sodium that gets into the brain to reduce how much work the brain is doing the calcium channel blockers reduces the amount of calcium that gets into the brain um to reduce um whatever the brain is doing or they calm down the pain that may eventually result in convulsion the GABA enhancers, what they do is that they uh, more or less improve the activity of GABA, which on a normal day, the job is to slow the brain down. Then the glutamate inhibitors, they stop or they reduce the activity of glutamate in the brain cells because on a normal day, glutamate is known to increase the activity of the brain. So you are getting, now there are also some drugs that they are more or less what you will call a mixed mechanism drug. Like... I don't want to say bubolo <laughs> and I don't want to say jama jama. But you see, when I hear the word, th these are like when, when I try to understand medications in school, I sometimes use slangs that are more or less inclined to my dialect or to my language to make me remember those drugs. So when I say mixed mechanism drugs, the first thing that comes to my head are jama jama drugs, drugs that match everything together, like all these jack of all trade dog uh, drugs that you just combine different mechanisms, go go to go everything combine to work. So these are mixed me mechanism drugs that help to solve the brain activities using various functions. A very common example is levetiracetam and lacosamide. Lacosamide is the one I remember a lot. Well, levetiracetam, pardon my pronunciation, but I remember it as Kepra. Kepra is a very simple way to remember it. But the problem is, like, when you see this medication on the world, it can come with either the brand name, the trade name, or whatever like name the company has given it. So you always have to be familiar with as much, as much names as you can. So these are the different classifications of medications that fall under anticonvulsants. So what are the things you should note as a nurse when you're taking care of somebody that is on anticonvulsants or you are um, administering anticonvulsants or basically when you come in contact with patients or the drugs, what are the things that you should know as a nurse? The first thing you should know as a nurse is that you should monitor seizure activity of the patients that are using this drug to know if the seizures are reducing or they are getting worse, just to know if the drugs are even work, working, at, working at all. Then you watch for side effects of the drug. There could be mush pain, there could be dizziness, rash, or even drowsiness. You always check their blood levels. Do your regular blood test just to make sure that you don't have too much of those medications in the bloodstream that could cause um, toxicity or an overdose. Then you educate their patients on how to take their medications regularly and not just to stop taking their medications suddenly. Then you also try as much as possible to tell the patients to avoid alcohol use and sedatives. Now, this is a very dicey situation. Based on culture, rules, um, or different things that could be in play in a geographical location, you have to address this thing with caution. Because if it's a country where somebody has the right to take whatever they want you know they are adults as long as they are up to a certain age they have a right to take whatever they want regardless of what the doctor or the nurse is telling them you have to approach those things in a sensitive manner you don't force them you only have to like advise them that this is what is best but you can't like stop them if you know what i'm saying but there are some other geographical regions where you actually can be more um authoritative when you want to let them know what um, some substances can do to them when they are taking medications. If you know what I mean, yeah, you get it. So try to all, um, educate them on why they should not take certain drugs or certain um, drinks like alcohol, gin and all of that because it can impair the activities of those medications. 
So with this little explanation I've made, I hope now you have an idea of what anticonvulsants are so that when you go back to class, you will understand them. Mind you, antipsychotics, anticonvulsants are not exactly the same thing. So if you want me to make a video about antipsychotics, let me know in the comment section. If I get enough requests, then I'll consider it. If you want to watch more of my videos on pharmacology, click here and I'll see you in my next video.